Well, the season of the land has just oh, begun. Yeah. And uh, it's the time when we focus not only on our lives, but as a community, we do the same. Um, and so one of the main emphasis of the season is the idea of resisting temptation. And in the gospel passage, we are given a model to do this. So let's dive into it. You can that. First, we must get the context in which this, in which this text is given. The, the context in which this is given is called Jesus' preparation for ministry. It begins with the baptism of Jesus and then proceeds to his genealogy and finally ends with the text that we have today. After the preparation comes have finished, Luke goes on to give Jesus his inaugural sermon in the synagogue at Nazareth. God says to Jesus in his baptism, You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus is revealed as a prophetic prophet who is chosen by God to bring God's revelation and his salvation. Later, the genealogy takes the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam, which works in relating him not only to Jews, to Gentiles as well. The genealogy ends with the Son of God which seems to be the focus of both the baptism and the genealogy. Both are pointing to that to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. After Jesus has been tempted, as mentioned before, he returns to Nazareth for his first sermon. At the very beginning of the text, Luke describes Jesus as being full of the Spirit and being led by the Spirit. Just as the Spirit had led the righteous Simeon to Jesus during the purification of Mary, and as he led the preaching of John the Baptist, so now he leads Jesus, having descended upon him in his baptism into the wilderness. The leading of the Spirit makes it clear that Jesus is not being tempted for any fault of his own, but that this temptation is due to God's direction. The place of temptation is in the wilderness, and the time that Jesus spends here, 40 days, is intentional. He is emulating the wandering of the Israelite children through the wilderness for 40 years. It is also possible that he is copying both Elijah and Moses, who did the same, fasting for 40 days, that is. This connection is strengthened by Jesus' use of the law to refute the devil, specifically quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. The second parallel we find in this passage is that of Adam and Christ. It is hard to miss the phrase, son of Adam, son of God, that comes right before this text begins. Our first parents yielded to temptation while in the Garden of Eden, without being deprived of food, in stark contrast to Jesus who was in the wilderness and fasted for 40 days, yet he remained faithful. Christ is reversing the failures of sinful humanity being faithful were our first parents and the nation of Israel were unfaithful. In the first temptation, the devil references in a taunting way the proclamation made at Jesus' baptism, if you are the Son of God. You see, the devil is challenging Jesus. He's wanting to see if he is as he truly says he is and how God has proclaimed him to be. Then the devil tells Jesus to command this stone to become bread. Jesus answers, quoting Deuteronomy 8, 3, saying, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. The devil is tempting our Lord to doubt the provision and the protection of God. In the passage, Jesus quotes, God has protected and provided for the Israelite. Moses reminds the faithful that they must not doubt God's providence when they enter the promised land. Just as the Israelites were to trust God, so Jesus must trust God to provide for him. It is also possible here that Jesus' sense of mission is being challenged. Has he come here in order to work only miracles and use them in some cases to gratify his own desires? No, is the answer that Jesus gives. In the second temptation, our Lord is led up, probably referring to some sort of vision experience rather than an actual height by the devil. The devil then shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a proverbial blink of an eye. The devil claims that if Jesus bows down and worships him, he will give him all the glory and authority of the kingdoms he has just shown him, for he states that he has the power to do this. 
Of course the devil is overstating his case a little bit. Jesus' later encounters with the demonic forces show that they are well aware of the limitations placed upon them. What a horrible temptation this is and how it differs from the plan that God has to offer. If Jesus does but one small act, he will be given the power to rule the entire world. He would not have to endure the rejection of the people who just didn't understand him. He would not have to go through the pain and the agony of his passion. Yet our Lord knows the devil's love. And quoting Deuteronomy 6.13, he says, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him. If Jesus would have worshipped the devil, he would have acknowledged the devil's great authority. It would have been nothing less than a complete defection from God. This temptation is also attacking Christ's sense of mission. Will he submit to the evil one who rules the kingdoms of the world in order to gain the power to do the good he so desperately wants to do? Of course he must not, for his mission comes from God, and God will give him the sufficient grace to do his ministry though it will be hard. And the third temptation, again, modeled in a vision experience. The devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. He again taunts Jesus' identification as the Son of God, telling him to prove it by jumping down. The devil even tries to use Jesus' use of scripture against him, and he quotes Psalm 1, verses 11 through 12, saying, He will command his angels concerning me to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. The devil presents the job as making stronger Jesus' dependence on God. However, Christ sees it for what it truly is. It is an attempt to test God, and it is a sign of a lack of faith. Jesus replies to the temptation with Deuteronomy 6, 16. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus again rejects a false view of his mission in this final temptation. His ministry will not be one that turns to coercion, using supernatural powers to motivate or manipulate people. Instead, Christ is to come as a humble servant, emptying himself, being obedient to God to the point of death, even death on the cross. Finally, the text says, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Jesus will continue throughout Luke's gospel to win out victory over the forces of evil. Though, as St. Augustine mentions, Jesus will still be tempted by that other sort of temptation, that hard and harsh treatment, savage treatment, atrocious and ferocious treatment, namely his passion. The devil does not appear until the passion narrative later in chapter 22. So how can we apply this narrative to our lives? <laughs> I doubt any of us are going to enter the Judean desert anytime soon and have a personal account with the devil. <coughs> if part of the reason why the story was preserved and why Luke wrote down the text was to encourage those in the Christian community who were themselves facing temptation. The same applies for today. One of the main concepts in this text is the idea of control and how it plays out in Jesus' sense. In the first temptation, Jesus is trusting God's provision, his test. Do we not also question God's provision? In a culture plagued by instant gratification, we want what we want, when we want it, exactly how we want it. Yet maybe God is saying, wait, hold up, I have something better for you. Do we allow our struggles to form us, to allow us to trust in God, or do we harbor resentment and seek to act on our own? Christ in his temptation calls us to trust in God. Trust that often implies discomfort and uncertainty. Trust that leads us to taking up our own cross and following the crucified and risen Lord. He's the path of self-denial, the path that Jesus models here. There's something deeper, more life-giving and greater than fulfilling our own desires. It is to follow the path that God has set before us as revealed in the scriptures, borne witness to by the apostles, the prophets, and the martyrs, and articulated in the creed. So as we begin this
this season of Lent, seeking to emulate the 40 days of fasting that Jesus endured. Let us seek to give up control of our lives, which we hold so much. It's such a death grip. Let us ground ourselves in the scriptures so that we may be shaped by the words which are God breathed and be sustained by them. Let us seek to enter into that fast which Adam and Eve broke, but Christ kept having a life centered around God. May we resist the temptation to rely only on ourselves to gain power at the expense of losing who we truly are. And finally, the urge to control God and use our gifts to control others. May we, as the author of Hebrew writes, run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. To him be the glory in the, in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations.